I didn't see you there. Hi, I'm Rebecca Fons, Film Scenes Programming Director. Thanks for joining us for this virtual presentation of Metropolis, which we're presenting as part of our Science on Screen program. Science on Screen is an initiative of the Coolidge Corner Theater with major support from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Stick around after the film for a conversation with Sarah Henderson and Rob Tigan from the National Czech and Slovak Museum and Library in Cedar Rapids. We will be discussing the museum's exhibit, A Century of Robots, From Chapek to Now, and the many thematic layers of Metropolis that are still relevant today. The conversation will start right after the credits of the film, so don't miss it. All right, well, hello to our virtual audiences. My name is Rebecca Fons, and I'm Film Scenes Programming Director, and I want to welcome you to our Science on Screen post-screening discussion of Fritz Lang's 1927 masterpiece, Metropolis. This film is part of the third year of Film Scenes Science on Screen program, and this year we're presenting five total films, including a virtual screening of Making Waves, The Art of Cinematic Sound, followed by a discussion with Academy Award-winning sound designer uh, Gary Rydstrom, and the film Coded Bias, which will include a virtual conversation with the film's director. Science on Screen is an initiative of the Coolidge Corner Theater with major support from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and Film Scene is honored to be a recipient of this grant again this year. You can find all of our Science on Screen programming and our virtual offerings at our website, which is icfilmscene.org. Uh, I'm super excited to be joining conversation with two special guests from the National Czech and Slovak Museum and Library located in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. The museum's current exhibit, A Century of Ro Robots from Chapek to Now, is the perfect pairing for a discussion about the exhibit, the work and influence of Chapek, and the film Metropolis. So first, welcome to Sarah Henderson, who is the Associate Director for Lifelong Learning at the National Czech and Slovak Museum and Library. She holds a dual bachelor's degree in art history and anthropology from Grinnell College. She also holds a master's degree from Georgetown University in art history and museum studies. Sarah works to deepen the museum's connection to the community through accessibility and increasing partnerships. And also I welcome Rob Tigan, who is a graduate of Mount Mercy University with a major in English and a minor in creative writing. He also took several film classes while there. He has been working with the National Czech and Slovak Museum since 2018 as a contract worker with the Education Department. Rob has a passion for over-explaining the deeper themes of fiction to any unsuspecting bystander. Welcome, Sarah and Rob. Hi. Hi. Rob, I love that, that you have that in your bio, that you're like, I really love talking deeply about things, even if people aren't ready to. So I yeah, that's perfect for today. <laughs> it's kind of what an English major teaches you to do. <laughs> It's a curse. <laughs> the heavy is the head that wears the crown. So yeah. um, yes. Well, well, first off, I want to just talk a little bit about um, the exhibit at the museum, which is again called A Century of Robots from Chapek to Now. And it's available to museum uh, visitors until October 25th. And for mm -hmm. listeners who aren't as familiar with Chapek, can you provide sort of a brief introduction of who he is and, and a little bit about the exhibit and kind of the, the curation of the, of the exhibit? Absolutely. I, I think most people don't know who Chapek is. So this isn't one of those names where you should feel bad about not knowing who he is. He's kind of fallen into oblivion unless you're a, 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 an English nerd like Rob <laughs> or a Czech nerd like myself at the museum. Um, so he and his brother, Josef Chapek, uh, were real activists in their time, 1920s. So we're thinking, obviously, the World War, War, World War I era and we're coming into the rise of the Nazi party in this time and Yosef and Karl did a lot to try and, and protest these uh, authoritarian regimes including communism um, so they're quite prominent people in their time and one of the ways that Karl did that was through his written literary works um, Yosef was a visual artist and we feature both of these brothers in the exhibit um, so Karl wrote these these plays uh, and short stories that have a very obvious class undertone. They're talking about uh, labor force. Forced labor is literally the translation of roboti, where he gets the word robot when he invents it for this play, Rossum's Universal Robots, written in 1919 and, and first performed 1920, uh, somewhere around there. Um, and, and there's this obvious immersion all of a sudden of science fiction. That, that happens with this play. He's invented this concept of the robot or an artificial human and he's the first to do this and, and we have to remember this is 1920 this is pre uh advanced manufacturing this is pre you know industrial revolution um taking over the whole you know world and europe specifically so he's really before his time and and i think 
films that have engaged in science fiction can trace their roots back to this one play from 1920. So it's quite phenomenal what he contributed to literature, to film, um, and, and to the arts in general, um, but none of us know his name. So that's kind of our hope behind this exhibit is that we would get some of the science nerds, some of the literature nerds, obviously Czech folks don't even really know his name either, um, to, to better understand that, that he had a huge role in shaping the arts. Mm -hmm. And can you talk a little bit more about RUR, the play? I mean, you know, what sort of yeah. just the general synopsis is? Uh, are you, you want to take this one, Sarah? No, go ahead, Rob. Go ahead. Um, I can talk about it. I, I would um, say RUR is really at its core about the rights of people. And in this case, these people happen to be robots. And he sort of, while the play begins by viewing the robots, as machines and tools for working eventually. The robots become so advanced, a la our understanding of sort of the singularity. Uh, they become the next step in human evolution because greed has made the, uh, its original creator and the people using those robots just lazy and mm -hmm. sterile. It's very Black Mirror in, in its own <laughs> it way, is. as yeah. is, as That's a great is pop, Metropolis. That's a great pop culture reference, too. Like, so much of Black Mirror, I think, can be traced to, to RUR. So the very general plot, just sort of a beginning, middle, and end, is you're, you're in this factory where they're manufacturing um, robots, and your cast of characters in the play are some of the factory workers, including the factory owner. And, and his wife, who we're actually introduced to in the prologue before they're married. Um, she is what you might say like an SJW. She's a human rights activist. She's characterized as being over the top, um, which at, I, with my students, we had a lot of conversations about is, is Carl Chapek making fun of the human, right, human rights activist or is he making mm -hmm. fun of the way people portray human rights activists, which is like gets a little meta there. Mm -hmm. um, but so she's this activist that gets brought over to the dark side, so to speak, because she marries the factory owner um, and she just becomes this na naive, oblivious um, part of uh, the, the factory life um, on the island. Uh, and then you're taken through uh, all of a sudden to the next section of the play. We're now in the heat of what seems to be an early revolution. And, and there's a lot of tension and anxiety around, oh, my gosh, are the robots coming for us now mm -hmm. on this island where we're manufacturing the robots? Um, you come to find out that um, this naive female character has burned the documents on how to manufacture robots. So all of a sudden, the secret to making these artificial humans has been lost, um, and they're coming to revolt and to kill off all of humanity. So, so that's kind of like your peak um, conflict. Not kind of, it definitely is the end of humanity, <laughs> is a peak conflict. <laughs> um, and, and the play ends with all of them dying except for one. And he is just, I think his name literally translates to builder or something like that. Um, and he is introduced to you as just the noble laborer. And the only reason that the robots save him is because um, they recognized in him some value and that he would work. Um, but then they've been left with this reality that uh, they don't have any way to recreate more mm. robots because the recipe has been lost by who we thought was a naive female character. Um, and so then the robots think that this laborer is their key to survival and, and evolution kind of as Rob was talking about. Um, and it's very interesting at the very end, sort of the last few pages, there's this Adam and Eve story where two of these robots have figured out emotion and love and they have basically become humans. So mm. there's this conversation that also happens around humanity. What does it mean to be human? And maybe these robots all along were human, but because they were treated as subhuman, they were treated as property, and they didn't see themselves as such. There's a lot of really heady sort of discussion and interpretation around humanity. And um, in the end, they reproduce and start life over again. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's a hundred years ago, too. I mean, that's, yes, that's like, so, the amazing part. Yeah. I mean, that it's, yeah. you know, that it's so relevant. It's there are themes of that that feel so relevant for now and certainly are still being explored in literature and in popular culture and film and, you know, and also just super ahead of its time in certain ways. And, and yeah, I love that Black Mirror reference, Rob, because I think like it's these are these are the big questions. You know, these are the big mm -hmm. like, who are we as people? You know, how how are, how do we develop? How do we evolve? Um, yeah. yeah.
I even think so much of, of iRobot, which obviously has its own uh, literary source, but there's a lot of questions there about humanity too. And like, what does it mean to dream? What does it mean to feel? And, and that's a film that came out in my generation. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel so much of it is tied directly to R.U.R. Yeah. yeah, I feel like a lot of specifically the ending to um, Rossum Universal Robots is very, it's very 70s. It's very, I am legendy. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Richard, it's very like, and you didn't see, you don't see that in your more well-known classic science fiction. It's super dark. And that may be owing to the interwar period in which it was produced, or maybe it's just, called Tropic, but it's very, I think that in and of itself is revolution. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and it's interesting. So RUR was, like you said, Sarah, published in like the uh, 1920, right? Like, 19, mm -hmm. you know, and then Metropolis came out about seven years later into, yeah. in 1927. So, you know, can, like, maybe you can both speak about if you can sort of like what, like, is that sort of, was there something going on specifically? I mean, you talked a little bit about just what was happening in the world and, and specifically in the Czech Republic, but like, why do you think these like science fiction genre and science fiction themes were sort of emerging in that time? That's interesting. I mean, futurism, so my background is in art history, so I can't help but also draw this connection to futurism, which was this obsession with the modern machine and what was going to be possible in 10 years, 20 years, and moving at the speed of light and, and all those sorts of things. And, and your, your visual art even had this sort of speed and technology component to it that they were trying to portray in a 2D sense. Um, so I think World War I has a ton to do with it. Um, obviously, the, the innovations that are happening there filled people with such fear and anxiety. Um, but also, like, with the futurists, it was this hope towards, like, oh, all this exciting technology, and we're going to have this liberation. It might even be through death, death and chaos that there will be a liberation of sorts um, for humanity through that technology. The futurists were quite wrong, and I think they, they realized that. Um, so I think there's a little bit of that. And then science fiction too has so many threads of that anxiety and and that fear but then there's this liberation component too that happens at the end with with rur where there's the adam and eve story again and, and regeneration and a fresh start so to speak so I, that's my kind of art history perspective um that's the only thing that i can kind of think of what mm -hmm. do you think rob um well i think if you look at reviews of the time and i did look up uh, H.G. Wells' review of this movie, he called it derivative of R.U.R. Oh, wow. Specifically derivative of R.U.R., which I thought was really, really interesting. Um, I think the look of the movie is obviously aspirational, and it's trying to look what we thought the future was going to look like at that point. But, you know, as Wells points out in his review, there are no cars older than 1926. Um, and I think it's a little curmudgeonly because yeah. Wells was a known curmudgeon by this point, but it's, it's more what science fiction can communicate as a form mm -hmm. when liberated from the, the grounds of realism mm -hmm. more than anything. Because like the robots in Rossum Universal Robots aren't really classically described as like machines they're closer to clones in the yeah. way that uh in the way that Chopek describes them uh and, and that's the case with uh the man machine in metropolis as well later under the guise of maria they just they start with this uh c3pl looking automaton and then she becomes a, uh, a human-looking woman. Mm -hmm. And in, I would say in Metropolis, the robot is used more as an obvious plot device, whereas in Rur, it's kind of the focal point of the piece. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think it's so interesting to think about the way, not having read RUR, but having seen Metropolis, like the way that the 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 word clone is really interesting that so often in film and in and in literature you know it's like the robot isn't a just a square box i mean later like 2001 the space odyssey there is the the monolith you know this sort of these like sci-fi tropes or these sci-fi these iconic sci-fi you know 
items. Yeah. But so often the robot is in our own image. And he, I even think about like Frankenstein, mm -hmm. you know, he's built in man's yes. image and just thinking about how Chopek and then Fritz Lang were thinking about the, this, this idea of future and like sort of a potential enemy, but maybe also a sign of hope and how it's built in the kind of image of, of man and of woman and how interesting in Metropolis yeah. that Maria is this, you know, I, I think there's just so many layers going on of like the, that, that the robot is a female, you know, and I don't know yeah. if you have any thoughts on that, but I feel like that's like a, a master's thesis in itself, that part of that, of Metropolis. To kind of piggyback off of the Adam and Eve thing at the end of Rur, I feel like this sort of presents Robot Maria as the temptress, or evil squinty eye Maria, because for some reason the actress went with, oh, I'm evil, I'm just going to squint the one eye, <laughs> which is a heck of a choice. Um, it's, she's presented as like the temptress, and human Maria is very much presented as an ideal. And mm -hmm. it's really from the like 10 minutes into the movie where the main characters after this girl the whole time and just chasing after her. And it's, 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 it's a very biblical movie. Oh, there, sure. there are, there's that Babylon sequence. There's the pentagrams all over Rotwang's lab. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very much intertwined with technology and mysticism. Yeah, and I mean, you know, in, in Metropolis, there's like a, you know, mighty flood, you know, I mean, there's so many oh, wow. biblical things and like sort of references or commentary on sins. And it sounds like, you know, RUR has that sort of too. It's like they, I mean, hubris isn't a sin, but like that they, that they try, they wanted something that was just out, out of their reach. And then they, you know, they burn yep. the recipe and then, but then out of all of that comes this Adam and Eve. I mean, that before he even said the, I started talking about biblical themes, you know, the Adam and Eve sort of yep. characters in RUR are there. So it's so interesting that like these artists, it's like they needed to root this fantastical, these fantastical ideas in something that was sort of universal. These ideas of like sins and evil and yeah. good and, you know, and regeneration and rebirth and, and um, you know, forgiveness. Um, so I think that's interesting. And I wonder like where else do the two pieces you know, connect, like where are there other similarities and then also maybe where they're, we, where they diverge. And, and Rob, I don't know, I, you're familiar with both the text and the film so well, if there's other things that just seem really, really linked or things that seem totally opposite of one another. I, I would say they are really linked in the fact that the robots in Rur classically are more akin to the worker, the working class in Metropolis, mm -hmm. so much so that even the working class are numbered uh, we see uh, one nine one one there. I think that's the only number we see in the film. But the way they move is their robot. What we would think of today as robotic. Mm -hmm. but, you know, through through the uh, clock sequences, it's mostly clocks. There's an odd obsession with time in this movie, um, and there's the machine. Moloch semi-fantasy sequence as well. Um, but I would say it's very much, I thought it was going to be a movie as I was watching it for the first time about like the revolution of the people. And it turns out in the last 10 minutes, it's like, no, we can trust our corporate masters. It's totally fine. <laughs> we'll have this semi-messianic figure, um, which the, the main character is represented as. It's sort of this, this great mediator between the corporate entity and the people. It's, it's very, I feel like the last 20, 25 minutes takes a real turn. Yeah. It's like, I thought this was going somewhere like cool, like where every, everybody gets burned alive. And <laughs> so it's kind of a, a classic Hollywood ending as, as much as that was available in 1927. From an expressionist film. <laughs> well, he yeah. sort of he sort of like was maybe the like prototype for that like Hollywood ending. Like you know, Fritz Lang really sort of uh, maybe d disappointed her expectations. And also like when I was rewatching it for this conversation, I was thinking just how you know nearly a hundred years later, Metropolis feels incredibly relevant. I mean, like in an election year, hello, like there's okay. so much just sort of like these figureheads and the and the like working class and the 
and then the, the upper class and sort of the fighting and the, the stat levels of status and power. And so there, there's just, I think there's so many things that, yeah. you know, I mean, those are sort of, and those are also sort of universal themes. So it's not that specifically, you know, tied to 2020, but it did feel very relevant in that way. Yeah. Um, I'm interested. Yeah. Oh, please, yeah. um, another one of those sim similarities. There's also, so Helena is, is the female character, the wife of the factory owner. Uh, and there is a robot version of Helena. And, and there's this exchange where she's perfect in every way, the robot version. Um, but someone's explaining to her, one of the factory workers, like, yeah, except like her head is empty. Like that doesn't matter. That's fine. Uh, but she can't have babies. So she's really mm. worthless. And I remember with my students, we had a lot of conversations very similarly, similarly when we were talking about the portrayal of the activist as a woman, we talked about, okay, so is Chapek being progressive here when he is saying, oh, you know, there's no value to her because she can't have women. Is he pointing that out and how ridiculous that is? Or is he, is he actually just a man in the 1920s who feels that way about women? And we never came to a conclusion because he was very progressive for his time. Um, I mean, the Nazi party wanted to kill both him and Yosef. Uh, he died of the flu um, before they could, but they did kill Yosef in a concentration mm. camp. So he was a very progressive guy. So you almost want to think he's he's characterizing women in in this way that like obviously they are more than the ability to make babies. Um, yeah. And there's this whole conversation about sterility. So that's part of the sort of end of times as it's portrayed in RUR as women have lost the ability across the world to have babies. So no one's had a baby in like a year. And, and they're like, we're like, what are we gonna do? We're coming to an end. And there's this commentary about it's because humanity felt no need to go on without the, the need to work and like labor and all of that was tied to purpose. And so without a purpose, humanity felt no need to like continue on. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, there's so much interesting conversation happening there in fertility and sterility and the fact that he even chose to weave it in when you already have a revolution of robots taking over the world but he wanted to have this conversation around women and their value I think it's so interesting and I'm wondering if there are similarities there in what you were talking about with Maria and her portrayal oh for sure Rob I'm sure if you want to speak on that but I, I see I'm fe hearing similarities for sure well I would say the way the good Maria, as I'll call her, is presented is, is very much a, a mother figure. The first time the main character sees her, it, it's with, surrounded by like 20 children as she brings them into like the high area of Metropolis. It, and it's extremely, I don't get the, as much, you know, character motivation out of the main character. I think he's I thought he was chasing the girl from the beginning, and when he says to his dad, who's the villain of the piece, his dad and his uh, maternal grandfather are kind of the two main villains of the piece, I want to be with my brothers and sisters, which I guess is the people in this case, the workers. I, I didn't read that as ringing true, because I felt like, oh, he's chasing a pretty girl. Mm -hmm. But I, again, that's a more modern film sense on a film from over 80, you know, almost 90 years ago at this point. Uh, so that was a difficult thing for me to do when watching this movie is kind of divorce myself from those more, more modern takes on movies. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say there is definitely like something about the, you know, fertility children especially because you've also got that you know flood sequence where the workers who have destroyed the machines are celebrating while their kids drown in the working mm -hmm. city and like mm -hmm. it's wow. there there is something there yeah it's not quite as explicit as, as it is in her but it's there yeah yeah, and you know, also Maria, there is the, the good Maria and the bad Maria. And the good Maria, as Rob said, is presented. I mean, she's like, you know, she's like the she's like the Virgin Mary. You know, she's mm. she's like virginal and like perfect and beautiful and pure, but she's surrounded by these children. And then when when the robot takes on the 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 Vi vi the visage of <clears throat> Maria, you know, she's like a temptress, you know, it's a little like Madonna yeah. horror situation yeah. thing. Uh, you know, she's the temptress and all the men are sort of like, oh my gosh, like, you know, she, and she's doing this gyrating with her little squinty eye, as Rob said. So, you know, it's very much like, 
the, the two sides of the same woman um, and okay. how within a, within a woman, you know, can, there can contain multitudes and, and often the, the male gaze is sort of that the woman is either or. She's either the Madonna or the whore. Yeah. And I also wonder the same thing. Like, is this Fritz Lang, like, being very progressive and, like, making a really right. statement about, you know, women's, uh, about femininity and, and women's um, uh, freedom and women's sexuality? Or is he just sort of like a creepy guy <laughs> who wants to yeah. this this actress gyrate around with, you know, with like her little outfit on? So, so mm-hmm. it, there's, there's, there's really big questions about their motivation. I like it, to think that he's- It's basically a burlesque outfit. Yeah. It's, it's I mean, for 1927, it's very like, wow, I would have been amazed to be in the audience when that scene starts but yeah you wonder you wonder if how much is commentary and how much is is just his sort of um male gaze as well you know to these yeah so so yeah carl carl chopak writes in a very absurdist way like a lot of his humor is quite absurdist the entry scene where you meet helena she is also portrayed as a temptress and all of the factory workers are fawning over her and at one point the uh, manager of the factory says, well, you have to marry one of us because you came here and tempted us and we haven't seen a woman in in years because we're alone on this factory island. Um, And then she marries the factory manager. Um, But it's all so absurdist. He basically says, you have to marry one of us. And then she's like, no, I won't. And then he kisses her. And then in the next scene, they're married. So it's so absurdist. So I, the part, like the hopeful part of me wants to think that has to be commentary because it is so absurdist. Mm -hmm. But um, it's like you said, who knows? (laughs) Well, and I think, you know, sci-fi and other genres, including satire, um, you know, they, they do kind of play with those different you know, the allegory and metaphor, like I was just talking to a colleague about um, zombie movies, you know, and like, uh, you know, Night of the Living Dead, it's like, it's actually a very obvious allegory to race and, and, mm. and you know, the sort of fear, the, the fear of the other, you know? Yeah. And so I think there's some of that here too, you know, whereas it's like the, the other that is us, but, but the power structures between us and them and so I think again, like you hope that this is this is commentary meant to satirize or meant to shine light on these on injustices and um, imbalances and racism and all of those those themes that are you know just constant and always kind of you know grist for the mill in terms of like culture and yeah. film and literature. But you but you don't know. And I think and yeah. I you know I feel like there's that too. I mean, 1927, 1920, things were really different, but things were also really the same. Yeah, they are now. It was so difficult to read R.U.R. last year with my students without talking about race. I mean, the fact that robati literally means forced labor, um, and he chose that word specifically to invent this new word robot, which which was a an, art, an artificial human that was treated as a subhuman and then had to do work for free for humans. It, it was impossible to not talk about race, but I always tried to caveat it as like, we have no idea his intention, but but these are still the lessons that we can kind of take from this. And I, I can't help but think it was somewhat intentional in, in Carl Chopek's um, writing, just because in the very first introductory scene with him, the factory manager on the phone, he's mentioning sending desks to America and we have to get those desks to America. And I feel like it, it's a it's a weird intentional choice to say America in that sentence rather than anywhere else. And maybe it's just because America was consuming European products. I don't know. There could be a lot of uh, reasons for that. But that was my first clue. And then um, there's this really intentional dialogue between Helena and the factory manager, and she's like, "Yeah, when when my town first purchased." Uh, one of these robots I mean when they first came to our town to work and he's like no purchased Mm -hmm. it's your property you purchased it Hmm. that that feels like a conversation about like slavery or at least the discomfort that Helena is portraying in like ownership of something that seems and feels so human it it felt to me like a criticism um, of forced labor Mm -hmm. but again like intention is so difficult to assume a hundred years later but it at least is a very powerful piece to return to right now in today's uh, climate. Um, it just makes it so much more obvious um, that this has been a part of our human history. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and those comparisons and those themes, the, the same with Metropolis. I mean, issues of class, um, you know, all of that really, you can't watch that film and it sounds like you can't read 
or you are without, I mean, it's that it's, it's just, it has to be discussed. So, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's interesting that those themes continue to be so relevant, so continuously yeah. relevant. Yeah. And it was interesting. I, I just one more quick point. I was talking to a native Czech speaker. He's a, a contemporary artist. And I was telling him that we were getting ready to start reading this play. He was so excited. Oh, it's a classic in my country. And I was like, yeah, and we're studying it through, through a, a lens of, of racial equity and class equity. And he's like, oh, that's, that's really interesting. And I was like, well, yeah, the word robot comes from forced labor. And he's like, oh yeah, I guess it does. And he's a native Czech speaker, but that word robot has a, a very like feudalism root. It, it, it originally meant like serfdom, which was still a type of forced labor, but it was like European systems of government and it's like very archaic. Um, so even as a modern Czech speaker, he doesn't necessarily associate it with more modern forms of forced labor that have occurred in, in human history. And that was really interesting for me that even um, someone who understands the root of the word, there's that disconnect. Yeah. Interesting. It's fascinating. Um, and then, you know, it's like switching to sort of thinking about the, maybe not the, the peak of, of Metropolis, but certainly like, you know, a climactic moment. And it sounds like there's, you know, in RUR, there's like everybody burns to death. So, you know, there's a climax there too. But like thinking about the idea in, in Metropolis is like, what's the more compelling action? Is it peace or is it like destruction and revolution? And Rob, I don't know if you have thoughts on like, what, what do you think is more compelling, like sort of these two different options? Well, to, to me, it's always revolution, you know, overthrowing, over class systems is always going to be more fictionally and real world appealing to me but it's but the the again the turn the film takes in the last 20 minutes is like no we can work with you know the corporate entities that are represented by this white dude yeah so <laughs> Again, that's a very modern reading. That's an extremely modern reading, and not not at all what I'm sure Fritz Lang intended. I mean, he he had said in later interviews that, that kind of um, the mediator between the head and the hands or the heart. He says that's that's from the novel which uh, Metropolis is based on, which was written by a woman. I think that's mm -hmm. important to say. Yes, uh, um, um, it's a very fairy tale thing, but I think that message of togetherness at that point in time was really important, even though historically this was, according to history, one of Hitler's favorite movies. Wow. Yeah, Hitler and Goebbels apparently loved this movie, uh, but Hitler liked a lot of, you know, classic entertainment that was very high fantasy mm -hmm. um so don't let that c color your opinion but i do feel it's important to note yes um, that's, yeah that's fascinating i don't think he would have liked are you are really I, I, I don't know i don't think he would have i mean clearly he had probably at least one of the brothers uh, yeah yeah yes, exactly, exactly exactly well you know and i think the kind of my last two questions to pose to both of you are you know what do you think, you know, we're, we're, we're th speaking about these, these pieces very much in the modern lens. I think it's impossible not to, and to yeah. think about all the history that was happening at the time and that has happened since. So what do you think, you know, if, if Chapek and, La and Fritz Lang like showed up right now and saw us having this like virtual conversation, like would they be horrified by, by 2020 and the technology that we rely on and that we use? Or would they, like, what do you think that they would think of us and of 2020? Actually, actually, there is some virtual telephone technology used in Metropolis. So, so he'd probably I, be like, I get a finder's fee for that. I, that's me. Yeah, <laughs> that's me. I came up with that idea. Yeah. Too funny. I, I pose this question to my students um, all the time. Whenever we would be discussing something, I'd be like, okay, so today, do you think he'd be super jazzed about like the way labor works and capitalism? Or do you think he'd critique it? Um, and I think there are these like hopeful strands in RUR where the factory worker is talking about his vision for a world without hunger, without labor, without class division. The ironic thing is that all of that is being achieved through the forced labor of these, these non-human artificial intelligence like beings. Um, 
so there's like this irony here, but the, the vision was always to escape these, these human problems that have been a constant. Um, so his thought is like, if we have this constant workforce, no one would ever go hungry because there'd constantly be food being produced. Um, so I think parts of technological advancement would, would really make Carl very happy, obviously, like our ability to mass produce food, which comes at a, a huge cost as mm -hmm. far as, you know, equity and um, human rights are still concerned with that, with labor. Like, so he would still critique mm -hmm. the labor aspect of it, but I think he'd be excited about the technological advancement. I never think that he would have been completely anti-technology at all, but maybe there is just this overall critique of humanity and our inability to use technology for purely good, which mm -hmm. is still quite depressing. But yeah. I think that might, might have been a com comment on the times because yeah. what, what did we do as technology advance? We came up with gas and flamethrowers. Right. Murder technology. And immediately used it to kill hundreds of thousands yeah. of people. So. Yeah. 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 I do think on a, on a lighter note, I do think Fritz Lang would be like, hey, uh, I want to watch The Matrix. I want to watch, you know, Blade yeah. Runner. I want to watch, True. you know, The Day the Earth Stood Still. I want to watch all these films that have been like, yeah. you know, just thinking as like from my film perspective, like I, you know, when I watch Metropolis, I'm just like, man, this, this movie laid the groundwork for so many aesthetic choices and so many aesthetic influ it influenced people so, so much. Oh, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's an absolutely gorgeous movie. Uh, gorgeous, like, yeah. It, the matte paintings you used, the shots, it's all just absolutely stunning to look at. Yeah, you know? and, and his techniques. I mean, he he you know created techniques that are still used today. You know that are just like or or you know you just think like it looks so amazing. And Kino at Lorber has done an incredible restoration of it, and it looks even better than it ever has. But you know, it's just you, you see its influ his influence in films now, and it also in in story and you know Black Mirror yeah. and you know all of these stories of AI and and sort of the the moral. Um, the moral aspect of you know creating artificial intelligence or creating clones or robots and 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 then how do we yeah. have relationships and how we how do we respect those those others those other um, parts of ourselves? Um, well, so my last question would would be you know if if there's a theme or a sort of thesis statement or a lesson from both of these films, is it like you know don't trust technology or like you know just be very careful, tread lightly with technology, or are they saying something? Is it not really about the technology? Like, is it is it more about the the humanity? I, would I think say, so. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, go ahead, no. no, go ahead. I've been talking uh, first a lot. You know me. Okay. I, yeah. yeah. Well, we both do. Um, <laughs> I would say it's more where does your utopia come from? Because both these, both Burr and Metropolis, are essentially utopias, but it's on the backs of the robots and the worker. Mm -hmm. And just it's it's about the dark underbelly of a cloud city, basically. Mm -hmm. The yeah. cost of the cost of progress. Yes, the, this is the cost of, of progress, and only a few are gonna see like the best that nice track you see in that second or third shot from the yeah. sons of I want to say Olympus. Maybe it's not Olympus. It's the sons of something. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But then you have these just generic looking workers keeping everything running behind the scenes. They're literally like behind clocks moving them on their own with their hands. Um, same with the robots in Rur, yeah. where in Rur it's more, you know, we're going to become dependent on this technology. You don't see that as much in Metropolis. So there's less of that, but it's very much like still, you're we're able to lead our, the lives we do because of the robots or the underclass or the worker. Yeah. I think that's a bit, that's still a very important idea, even in an election year, even in 2020. Mm -hmm. We can Absolutely. only we, we can only do the things we we want to and live the lives we want because somebody's putting in the hard works on work. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I think I think that echoes very true for RUR as well. It's so much more about humanity and and sort of those compromises that you make for your own utopia. 
Um, I think I, I just kind of realized in listening to you talk that there's this commentary when we were talking about fertility of like, you know, this whole discussion of what is humanity. So if humans lose the ability to reproduce, are they then no different from the robots that they've been treating? You know, because the whole thing with robots is they can't reproduce, so they're not human. They just look like human, they feel like human, they're made up of organs just like humans. Um, but we made them through a factory and they can't reproduce, so they're not human, and therefore we don't have to treat them like human. But then at the end, in this final scene, Helena is lamenting the fact that she can't have a baby. Mm. And that was the only thing that made robot Helena not worth anything. So it, it's, it's very much like a holding up a mirror. It's like you're no different than the people who are holding up your cloud city. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's certainly a lot to think about. And I think, you know, I, I encourage everyone who's maybe just watched Metropolis and now has watched this conversation to check out RUR and check out the exhibit at the Czech and Slovak Museum because it's just, not only does it sound like uh, Chapek was just a really influential writer, but also, you know, it just, there's so many interpretations and so many different threads and themes within his work um, that feel relevant today. So, so Sarah and Rob, thank you so much for such a great conversation. I feel like it's sort of a heavy conversation, but a, <laughs> a great one. Yeah, yeah. It, it took a heavy turn there. Yeah, it took a heavy turn, but you know, it's you know, it's a heavy, heavy, heavy year, heavy conversation. You know, it's all right. Yeah, very true. In our last moment, can you let people know where they can find more information about the museum, about this exhibit, or just about what you have coming up? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, all of our information is on our Facebook, um, and then our our main website as well. But it's a great way to just kind of see you know updates from us regularly to just like our Facebook, or you can subscribe to our our email list on our website. Um, you, anybody can reach me at shenderson at ncsml.org if you have anything you'd like to know more about, if you want to schedule a tour of the exhibit. We are open, just masks required and social distancing. Um, and then I would just say if, if you want to buy a copy of the play, it is very short. My students read it in like a week and we are reading it out loud in the classroom. So you could sit down and read it silent to yourself very easy. And it's for sale in our store. Um, if you can't be bothered to read a book, I, I understand that is hard sometimes to do, especially when we're in a heavy environment right now. Um, it's for free on YouTube. Like plenty of company theaters have performed it and uploaded it. So if you just look up RUR, you'll, you'll find a version of it and you can watch it on YouTube for free. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for a wonderful conversation and for giving us a lot to think about, about Metropolis and the history of robots. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.